Welcome everybody. I'm Peter Hudson. I'm the director of the Centre for Palliative Care at St Vincent's, uh, which is a collaborative centre of the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'm also uh, co-chair uh, of the Palliative Care Research Network, along with uh, Professor Jennifer Phillip, and delighted uh, to have you attend this important forum. Um, and it's a great opportunity for to hear from our international guest, Peter O'Halloran. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Palliative Care Research Network acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So just to sort of orientate people to the Palliative Care Research Network, we're very fortunate to have some state government funding to help us evolve evidence-based palliative care and a kind of key aim of the Palliative Care Research Network is to foster the evolution of uh, collaborative scholarly inquiry in palliative care. And today's forum, in keeping with that aim, um, is going to focus on some of the concepts underlying realist evaluation and how this methodological approach can help support clinical practice by drawing upon examples from palliative and end of life care research. Today's session is being recorded, so I encourage you, if you have colleagues who are unable to join us today, um, please let them know that uh, this will be available on the Palliative Care Research Network uh, website in due course. Um, and we, one of the things we like to do is provide an opportunity for Q&A, so please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll, we'll hold questions over to the end, but you're welcome to uh, lodge those questions as the presentation ensues so that we do have a few questions ready for uh, Peter at the end of his presentation. So it was with uh, great pleasure that I welcome uh, Dr. Peter O'Halloran. Um, Peter gained his PhD after a 20 year career as a clinical nurse in the UK's National Health Service. He's currently a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University in Belfast where his research includes an all-island realist evaluation of transition to adult services for young people with life-limiting conditions, a realist evaluation of the Liverpool care pathway, the dying patient, and also a randomised controlled trial of advanced care planning with older patients who have renal failure. Peter is the research and development lead for nursing in Northern Health and Social Care Trust, uh, and is a former chair of the Northern Ireland Palliative Care Research Forum. And he recently led the NIHR-funded Partnership for Palliative and End-of-Life Care Research in Northern Ireland. So we're in very good hands, um, indeed, to hear about realist evaluation, its applicability to evidence-based clinical practice in palliative and end-of-life care. Uh, it's great for me personally to see Peter again. I, I had some um, affiliation with Queen's University going back a decade or so ago, um, and it's, we're really pleased that Peter's uh, uh, fortunately in Melbourne at present, and it was an opportunistic um, uh, uh, occasion for us to uh, develop this particular forum in keeping with his expertise. So thank you once again, Peter, a warm welcome on behalf of all of us, and I'll hand over to you now uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, my first Christmas time in Australia, so it's rather strange to be in, in 25 degree heat rather than five degrees as it is back in Belfast. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now, put the presentation up. There we go. <clears throat> so, realist evaluation research. what it is and how to use it to support practice in palliative and end-of-life care. Here's the plan um, for the webinar. I'm going to set the scene by looking at types of evaluation, then consider why some interventions work and others fail. I'm going to bring forward some of the ideas underlying realist evaluation, particularly structure, agency and critical realism. 
uh, kind of have a little think about what we actually mean by an intervention and what we mean by context. Think about how interventions work. Then talk about realist review and realist evaluation, give you some examples, um, and talk about how you can use realist research. And then finish off with some of the limitations, the promise, and the potential. And then we'll have some time for questions um, at the end. So here's a very broad brush background. You'll be aware there's all sorts of ways to do evaluations. But at two ends of the spectrum are the experimental end, where we're looking at it's empirical, it's pragmatic evaluations. And there's an assumption there that there's a real world out there. It's independent of our perceptions. And we can truly experience it. We can objectively measure it. And that's the sort of thinking that underlies randomized controlled trials before and after studies and the like. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got interpretive, constructivist evaluations. Here, the assumption is that all truth claims are socially situated and there's no such thing as objective reality. An example of that is fourth generation evaluation. There are strengths and weaknesses of, of both of those. Let's think of about some of the weaknesses uh, because, of course, I want to come forward and say that realist evaluation uh, fills some of the gaps. So the weaknesses of experimental evaluations, particularly when it comes to uh, evaluations of complex interventions, are these. That an experimental evaluation, an RCT, can demonstrate, but not necessarily explain effectiveness or non-effectiveness. Um, it, by its very design, can filter out contextual, real-world factors. Consequently, um, doesn't facilitate the transfer of interventions from one context to another, and often produces contradictory results um, depending on the context. If you've ever looked at a, the forest plot on a Cochrane review, you'll have noticed the, um, the different uh, results that come from a, a range of, uh, from, random, from, from randomized controlled trials, all looking at the same intervention. What about constructivist evaluation as well? These can produce, in, in a way they're designed to produce clashing perspectives. The results are consciously non-authoritative because no one perspective is privileged over another. And, and though they drill down into a particular context, then it becomes difficult to generalize out of those contexts. Um, let me speak personally for a minute. Just thinking about why some interventions work and others fail or fade away. As Peter said, I worked for uh, 20 or more years in the National Health Service in the UK. And um, during that time, and I'm sure that's the case wherever you're working, all sorts of changes and initiatives were put forward. All sorts of interventions, both clinical and organizational, uh, were tried out. And uh, what I noticed was that some succeeded some failed. Some succeeded with one part of an organization, some failed in another part. And it just intrigued me. Well, what, what was going on? Because very often you'd have the same intervention, but which would have completely different effects or um, impacts depending on the context. So that, that always puzzled me and interested me. And, and this came to a head, oh, some years ago now, um, when my, my colleague, Rona Blackwood, now Professor Rona, Black, Rona Blackwood, had just finished her PhD. And this, this wasn't a palliative care PhD, but it was about protocolized weaning um, of patients from mechanical ventilation in the intensive care unit. And Rona had spent a lot of time with a number of intensive care units, bringing in this intervention, working very hard with them to put it into practice um, so that she could do a trial. And, uh, and uh, th this... This had been successful in the sense that, you know, they really had changed practice during the trial period. But uh, I was speaking to Brona after her research was finished, and I said, well, how are the units getting on now with that protocolized weaning? She said they all stopped. I said, I was stunned. I said, but you, you and they put so much work into making that happen. You know, how could it be that they just stopped? And... Uh, I just thought I've got to I've got to think more deeply about this, and I began to go into the literature on um, 
implementation science and sustainability. And I, I came across um, this uh, this key review, uh, very long, <laughs> very long review, which I, I read in full, uh, led by Trish Greenhouse. How to spread good ideas: a systematic review of the literature on diffusion, dissemination, and sustainability of innovations in health service delivery and organisation. Full of full of um, information across a vast range of areas, but one in particular stood out to me because um, Trish and Co. Um, one of the approaches that they that they advocated, or at least foregrounded, was. Uh, called realistic evaluation at that stage. And that uh, sent me off then to look at, at that particular approach. And I, I read this book, Realistic Evaluation, published 1997 uh, by Porson and Tilly. That's Porson, um, Paul Porson and moustached um, Tilly. Uh, I bumped into him at a conference, so I took the opportunity to, to, to take their photo. And uh, Realist Evaluation really was the book that started off the, the, the whole movement uh, to use this in healthcare. Um, I'd recommend the book to you. It's, it's actually, <laughs> well, I found it very interesting. I think you would too, because it's, uh, it's full of real world examples. And it's also, um, I mean, look at their faces there. It's quite humorous, uh, somewhat sarcastic in its approach. So it's, it's a good read. One of the, so some of the ideas behind this evaluation have their roots in social science, and in particular in those ideas of structure and agency. Um, so let's think about those. Social structure, these are the, the relatively enduring ideas, technologies and relationships that already exist in the world before we come to it. They're the structures that we find are already there when we're born, which shape us as we grow in our world, and which can act as mechanisms to produce events. So we think of things like, you know, we, when you're born, you're born into a family and uh, then you go to a school and uh, perhaps you go to university or, you, or you, um, you, you go into your career. All of those things are there before you arrive. There's social structures that you then move into. But of course, you don't move into that just as a passive being. You're a human being. You have agency. So you're not passively shaped by social structures. And in fact, those social structures can't exist apart from your participation, along with all the other human beings who are taking part. And human beings, as human beings, we have this um, unique ability to think, to reason, to believe, to intend to do things, to love and to hate. And of course, social structures by themselves can't do that. Here's a quote from Margaret Archer, a social scientist on uh, agents and agency. Agents, you and I, possess properties and powers distinct from those pertaining to social forms or social structures. Among them feature all those predicates such as thinking, deliberating, believing, intending, loving, and so forth, which are applicable to people, but never to social structures or cultural systems. These ideas inform critical realism, which is the, um, the philosophical approach which underlies realist evaluation. So let's talk a little bit about critical realism. Realism, realist. This is the idea that the natural world does exist independently from our perception of it. So, but it's on top, that's the ontological claim, the claim about the nature of the world, the being of the world. But we take a critical approach to it. In other words, our perceptions and our scientific studies of the world are dependent on human language, they're influenced by social and power relations. So that's epistemology, how we know things. So the task of the social scientist or the healthcare researcher is to investigate the world and produce descriptions and explanations that are closer and closer to reality. There is a reality out there, um, but we recognize that our perceptions of it are shaped by our social situation. Um, standing behind Porson and Tilly is Roy Basker, who is a philosopher of science, or was the late Roy Basker. Um, now, Ray Porson has recently, more recently, distanced himself from Roy Basker, but certainly that's in the background of their seminal book. 
So let's think about what he says about critical realism. First of all, he says something about the nature of reality. He says, reality is made up of things and events. And intuitively, that makes sense to me. Events are generated by things, including people, that possess tendencies, liabilities, and powers which can operate as mechanisms that cause events. And these events may or may not be perceived by humans. In other words, there's all sorts of things that we can perceive with our senses, but lots of things that we can't. Mechanisms are not observable, but can be inferred from what is observed. It was talk a little bit more about mechanisms later on. Human agency exists together with other mechanisms and structures which may enable or constrain the agent in the achievement of their goals. Okay, so there's Roy Bascar's critical realism in a nutshell. How does that fit onto realist evaluation? I've added the emphasis here to bring out the similarities. So this is from Porson and Tilly's book. They say the basic task of social inquiry is to explain interesting, puzzling, socially significant regularities, which we call outcomes. Explanation takes the form of positing some underlying mechanism which generates the regularity and thus consists of propositions about how the interplay between structure and agency has constituted the regularity. Within realist investigation, there is also investigation of how the workings of such mechanisms are contingent and conditional, and thus only fired in particular local historical or institutional context. And a key thing to note here is that the outcome of this realist evaluation is a theoretical explanation of events. This is theory building. Well, what do we mean by an intervention? This is what I think. Not on my own, but this is my distillation of it. Interventions embody the theories of those who devise them about what is likely to produce a desired outcome. Think about that for a moment. Um, when you think of it in that way, it's, it's quite obvious that whenever we, whenever we make an intervention with an outcome in mind, behind that, explicitly, or but more, more frequently, implicitly, we have an idea, we have a theory working. If I do A, this will result in B. And of course, you know, in, with, with simple interventions, that can seem very obvious. But with complex interventions, the link between A and B can be quite, uh, quite difficult to tease out. So what happens then when an intervention is introduced? When it's introduced, it changes the context by providing further reasoning, opportunities, permissions, legitimations, authorizations, and limitations. So presenting people with a different set of circumstances in which to exercise agency, leading to different outcomes. And the process of how people interpret and act upon these opportunities and ideas are known as the program's mechanisms, Helen Chain's definition there. What do we mean by context? Context is the spatial or geographical or institutional location into which programs are embedded together with the prior set of social rules, norms, values, and interrelationships gathered in these spaces, which set limits on the efficacy of program mechanisms. So how do interventions work? Well, let's think about that then. An intervention, which I've labeled I, with certain properties and characteristics is introduced into a pre-existing context. The intervention alters the context so that mechanisms such as thinking, feeling, planning, and reasoning are triggered in groups and or individuals. And these unseen mechanisms, because of course we can't see somebody thinking and feeling and planning and reasoning, these unseen mechanisms result in people changing their patterns of behavior, which we can observe and measure as outcomes. <clears throat> now, aspects of the context can help or hinder the generation of mechanisms and so affect outcomes. And we can bring this theory together into what we call context, mechanism, outcome configurations, famously CMOs. And all that says is, look, these things work together. You, you cannot understand um, the, how the intervention works unless you understand the mechanisms, the context, and how those interact to produce the outcomes that you see. So, okay, those are 
background ideas. Let's see how they're put into practice with realist evaluation and realist review. Now, in, when we're planning an evaluation of any intervention, typically we'll do a review of the literature, whether we're doing realist evaluation or any sort of evaluation. And that will tell us what, what's known, what's unknown, and therefore what research questions remain to be answered. But if we're doing a theory-driven evaluation, which a realist evaluation is, we also need to understand existing intervention theory. And if it's a realist evaluation, we need a realist understanding of the literature leading to realist theory. So we need a realist review. What is a realist review? Here's the definition from the Ramesses Publication Standards, published in 2013. Uh, a realist synthesis or realist review, these terms are synonymous, applies realist philosophy to the synthesis of findings from primary studies that have a bearing on a single research question or set of questions. So a realist review has some special characteristics. Uh, reviewers make a systematic realist assessment of each paper included in the, in the review, seeking information on the theoretical background and characteristics of the intervention, how it was thought to work, by the people who put it into practice, looking at the outer and inner settings for implementation, um, looking at the characteristics of the individuals involved, the information process, and the characteristics of the context thought to influence outcomes. And you'll see ideas from implementation science coming through there. Then there's a data synthesis. So the review team independently assess each paper, identify common components from the data extraction forms, reflect on candidate theories, discuss findings, achieve a consensus uh, on the explanatory power of each theory, and then develop a theory that provides a plausible explanation of events in terms of intervention characteristics and context mechanism outcome configurations. What about realist evaluation? Here's the Ramesses II, uh, uh, definition. Realist evaluation is a form of theory-driven evaluation based on a realist philosophy of science that addresses the questions, what works, for whom, under what circumstances, and how. And this can empl employ a range of designs and methods and, and different types of data. And the main outcome is the program theory, which is derived from the CMOs. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> this is um, some recent research I was involved in with uh, Deirdre McGrath. Uh, shortly to become Dr. Deirdre, we hope, uh, with my colleagues there from Queens. So this was an exercise intervention for women following treatment for ovarian cancer, a realist evaluation of a co-designed implementation process. I'll just take you through what we did there. So the aim was to develop, implement, and evaluate an exercise intervention for women following treatment for ovarian cancer.
Okay, it's, it's, it's back on. It's back on. So, yeah, just continue. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, well, hang on. Um, so, up here, I'm on the screen here. So, what's happening? Um, what are they saying? <laughs> but are they, are they, are they am I still screen share? I am. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, folks. Um, internet problem there. So you see. So <clears throat> this was a mixed methods design, a single center study, a formal co-design process. We collected data on recruitment, engagement. We did realist interviews with patients, carers, and healthcare professionals, and then produced a final realist synthesis of the program theory. Um, this went pretty well. Uh, you can see that recruitment and adherence and retention was was pretty good, and we were able to we were able to do a synthesis of, synthesis of theories in relation to intervention uptake, adherence, and retention. I'll just show you uh, one of those a summary of one of those theories in relation to adherence. In terms of the intervention, we found it was important that it was home based, that it was flexible that uh, had a suitable booklet, um, that the, the participants used an exercise diary, they had weekly telephone support, and that the uh, exercise was gradually increased. The mechanisms we noted was that um, this worked by reducing social anxiety. It worked because the uh, participants felt an obligation to the facilitator, they built up a relationship with her, and didn't want to let her down by not exercising. Um, that they needed achievable goals or, or goals that they perceived to be achievable to continue with the program, that they had to enjoy it, um, that it gave them feelings of competence and control, and that it helped them to think about recovery rather than about their, um, their illness. What helped in the context? Well, this seemed to work better for younger, for better educated participants who also had a history of exercise prior to their illness. It worked better when their symptoms were managed, when they had a supportive social network, and whether, when the weather was better. We're in Northern Ireland, after all. Uh, negative context, um, if they were experiencing, experiencing problem symptoms, uh, time constraints, life events, and also menopausal symptoms, uh, you know, particularly in this group. Next, I want to talk about a, a realist review. This is one I did with colleagues on advanced care plan advanced care planning with patients who have end-stage kidney disease, systematic risk review published in Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. So what you see here is um, half of uh, a figure on illustrating the theory. So let me uh, talk you through this. Um, first of all, we'll go down the middle here. And what what it starts with is a description of an intervention. And you can see that it's um, an intervention that, um, that is designed to, I'm sorry, the, the first thing is about training. So what, what we've got here actually is, is, that is sort of like a two-stage implementation. And this would be fairly common, I, I suspect, because it starts off with training for the staff and then moves on to what the staff do with patients and clients. And so, starting with the training of the staff, we're looking at um, training for them which addresses their concerns about advanced care planning, optimizes their skills and clarifies processes. Um, and the mechanisms that are triggered then for, a clinical staff, for clinical staff is that they recognize that advanced care planning is valuable, it's useful. And then they gain confidence to start discussions with, with patients and their surrogates. Those are the mechanisms. You can see that you can't, you can't see those things. These are things that are going on inside people, and yet they're the things which actually drive people's actions. 
so those actions then would be to engage with the patient and their surrogate decision maker, family member or whatever, um, around advanced care planning. That's the second stage of the intervention. And what we found was that if the ACP intervention itself should be simple, individually tailored, culturally appropriate, uh, it should actively involve the surrogate, it should be designed to explore the patient's understanding of their condition and to elicit and document values and preferences for care and treatment in the event of incapacity. Moving on then, mechanisms now generated in the patient and their surrogate. So the patient develops trust in staff. They're able to clarify their values and beliefs about their condition. They're able to learn skills to enable them to participate in discussions. The surrogate then is, um, becomes emotionally prepared for decision making and the patient's preferences are made known to clinical staff and surrogates. The outcomes then are greater congruence of the patient's and the surrogate's preferences or at least a mutual understanding, increased quality of communi communication, confidence, greater confidence for the surrogate around decision making, more completion of advanced directives, and a diverse impact on preferences for life-sustaining treatment. So, um, you know, you cannot presume that advanced care planning is going to lead to people deciding to forego treatments. For some people, advanced care planning leads them to think, well, I would like every, every possible treatment going. Thank you very much. Let's consider um, some positive aspects of the context. So, first of all, Advanced care planning is going to work better where it's core business, where it's endorsed or required by the organisation and where it attracts system support. It's going to work better where you've got suitably, tra suitably trained staff available and those staff receive reminders and feedback on, ACP, on the ACP process. It's going to work better when ACP is culturally appropriate and takes account of patients' perceptions of their situation. And it's going to work better when the patient is prepared to consider death and dying and they have a positive view of advanced care plan. What's not going to help? Well, if ACP administration is complex, if there's lack of funded training, if it's a situation where there's poor continuity of medical care, it doesn't work well when it's crowded out by routine pressures, by focus on technology, um, and it's less likely to go well where the patient overestimates their life expectancy or where all concerned are reluctant to initiate the discussion. So how then can one use those, those sorts of insights in palliative care? Well, one of the things to recognize is, is the mantra from uh, Rear's evaluation is what works for whom in what circumstances. So it's valuable to look at the different groups who are represented here and ask yourself, well, what, what do they need to do and what's gonna happen for them? So let's consider that now. Some implications from pra for practice based on that example. Well, organizations should make advanced care planning core business by developing appropriate policies and administrative and quality assurance processes whilst providing resources for training and for sufficient staff to offer advanced care planning effectively. Staff trainers should address concerns, optimize skills, clarify processes, aiming to persuade staff of the usefulness of advanced care planning and to give them confidence to start discussions with patients and their relatives. The professional involved should develop an approach to ACP that is simple, individually tailored, culturally appropriate, actively involves surrogates and explores the patient's understanding of their condition. And when implementing ACP, professionals should aim to build trust with patients and their families, help the patient develop skills that will facilitate their participation in decision making, <coughs> pardon me, and build confidence in surrogates for their role in speaking faithfully for the patient. Let's think more generally about using realist research. So you read a piece of research like this. What do you do about it? You reflect on the characteristics of the possible intervention. A good piece of realist research will talk, talk you through um, the various components of, of interventions that seem to be important to their success. 
So you want to look at that and ask, well, could we do that here? Do we have the resources? You want to consider your context. Are there positive and negative aspects of the context present in your organization, in your area of practice that have been identified in that realist research? And if they're there, can they be co-opted or can they be changed? Or perhaps uh, the context is disabling. So going back to our example of the advanced care planning, if your organization is not prepared to make it core business, you may be better off um, delaying the attempt or doing some prior work to get the organization properly on side before you even make the attempt to bring it into practice. Um, you may ask yourself what sort of intervention in your context is most likely to trigger key mechanisms. I think this is a really important and valuable part of realist uh, research because you notice that the whole point of the intervention is to trigger certain mechanisms. It's not the intervention per se that actually produces the outcome. That sounds counterintuitive, but a, an intervention comes in to a situation, changes the situation, but then the people in it actually have to change their patterns of behavior to produce the outcomes. So that it's the people in it which are key. And if you're looking at those people in that context, you I can ask yourself, well, you know, what, what's the intervention got to look like to trigger those mechanisms for these, these people in this context to produce those outcomes? So that might lead you to actually modifying the intervention if you think that, you, that doing that is going to trigger the mechanisms. And are the likely outcomes valued in your context? Okay, so a, realist, a, realist, a good piece of realist research would, will not only tell you about outcomes that are expected, but unexpected outcomes. Um, and so it's worth thinking those through when you're thinking about implementation. I've been blowing the trumpet here for realist research. What are the limitations? Well, much of the research is purely qualitative. Okay, so um, we need to move beyond that, I think, um, so that qualitative research is happening alongside quantitative research so that we can link outcomes more effectively to theoretical mechanisms. Theory testing and replication are rare. In other words, a lot of risk research is producing um, novel uh, CMOs, novel sy research syntheses, but those are not, not often tested and very often not replicated. And therefore, theory development is piecemeal. Um, and a lot of realist research is, is not linked with existing social, organizational, and psychological theory. And so I think these are some, some of the limitations that, that can be addressed. What about the promise and the potential? Well, I think realist review and evaluation can produce research that does justice to the complexity of palliative care and end-of-life care. And that's partly because it gives appropriate weight to human feelings, motivations, and decisions for all the parties involved. Um, you know, it, it's easy to think, well, an intervention is all about resources. It's all about uh, it's all about procedures. It's all about information. All those things, of course, are necessary, but they're not sufficient because it's actually the people who are involved who need to change their behaviour. And we all know that behaviour change uh, is is not guaranteed uh, simply because um, somebody desires for it to happen. There are all sorts of reasons why behavior changes and all sorts of reasons why it does not. And that's to do with the humans who are actually there. What are they feeling? What do they want? What decisions are they making? And, uh, and, so, that's, and so that's where realist evaluation can really help you uh, to identify those and therefore to have a successful intervention. We can also recognize how social and organizational context can prove decisive for sex, successful implementation. And so paying attention to context is, is something that's very important before we even make an attempt to bring something into practice. And all of that should help practitioners to plan interventions that are more likely to succeed in practice. There we go. Sorry about the technical hitch, um, but over to you and any questions, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Peter. and. Um... Thanks for your patience during that uh, uh, drop in our, in our um, uh, internet connection. So much appreciated. Um, for the participants, if you could please, contrary to what I said in the, the introduction, if you could 
uh, use the um, the chat function to raise any questions or comments for Peter, as opposed to the Q and A option. That would be uh, very much appreciated. So please, we would like um, uh, any questions you have to be uh, uh, to put through that mechanism through the chat function. Thanks very much indeed. Peter, just wondering, um, while we wait for participants to, to log some questions, um, just thinking about um, are there ways a number of the people um, who are members of our palliative care research network and indeed others who are interested in kind of evidence-based practice may not necessarily be involved in sort of formal interventions, you know, well-funded interventions or, uh, or the like. And I'm just wondering, um, in your experience, whether you think there would be a place for uh, realist evaluation uh, occurring in scenarios where there's already uh, strategies or approaches uh, or processes in place in, a, in the clinical setting that are focused on, you know, for example, patient and or care well-being, whether they could be done, you know, at, at low cost or with minimal resources. Is there ways that you, you can kind of do a, a partial realist evaluation or address some of these matters without necessarily sort of full-blown research grant to, to resource and evaluation of this ilk? Yes, Peter, that, that, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, most, most of the projects I've been involved in have been funded. But um, as I mentioned, you know, my, my interest in this came out of clinical practice uh, and observing how how, how clinical practice ha happens within organizations. So I certainly think that one could take um, a realist, a critical realist approach to understanding how implementations happen. So, you know, whether, whether you have access to um, the, an opportunity to formally research a particular area, I think you can, you can approach it, you know, we're all of us, to, to a certain extent, experts in the areas in which we work. And so it's worth, you know, you, 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 you could, for example, sit down with your colleagues and say to yourselves, well, let's, let's work back from the outcomes. What outcomes are we really interested in? And then say to yourselves, okay, those outcomes are going to be the product of, of a, set, a consistent pattern of behavior for ourselves and for, for other people. Well, what is it that's going to help us make, make those patterns of behavior more consistent? And typically, that, you know, that, those, are, those are going to be things which are human decisions, um, personal and social decisions, which are happening in a particular context, aren't they? So you know, we all intuitively, when we're working in a particular context, we, we all know for ourselves, we just examine our own experience. We know that we um, there are some things we like doing, some things we find easy, some some things we find very difficult. Um, there are some things we know we should be doing we're not doing, mm -hmm. um, and you know the the temptation is to sweep that under the carpet and just sort of muddle through. But it's it's really worth sitting down, I think, with colleagues and saying, look, why are we finding that so difficult? What well, what is it that's stopping us from making this a consistent part of our practice? And you probably find that there, there are a number of constraints. Some of them will be with the context. Some of them, though, will be with how people are thinking and feeling um, about what they need to do. So, for example, we all know, I think, that um, anxiety is a large part of most of our lives. And that's often generated by tasks that we're faced with um, that we find daunting or intimidating. Um, and uh, so... To sit down with colleagues and say, okay, why are we worried about that? You know, what is it that's that's making us shy away from doing doing this thing and dealing directly with that anxiety? Or, for example, we might say, one of the things that you find continually, I think, coming up through realist evaluation is the idea of self-efficacy. Um, and again, that I mean that talking about linking with other theories, that links very nicely, I think, with um, social cognitive theory, Alfred Bandura's work you know which is quite well developed in the um, social psychology literature and this is the idea that um, people do things when they feel that they're able to do them and where we feel I'm not able to do it I usually don't even make the attempt um, and again that's 
partly context dependent, but it's partly about how I perceive myself and how I perceive the nature of the task. So all those things I think could be um, with a bit of facilitation, they could be quite uh, effectively addressed in clinical team meetings. You know, what are the outcomes? What are, what are the patterns of behavior that are gonna produce those outcomes? What is, what's gonna help or hinder those patterns of behavior, both in terms of mechanisms inside the people who are gonna to have to do it and the context which can help or hinder. Think about those things. I, I think that would be possibly a very fruitful thing for teams to do. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. There's a few more questions coming through. Um, thank you very much to the participants. And um, just uh, from one, um, from, from Claudia, who's interested in the idea of reviewing uh, program theory, and she's wondering whether you could provide additional information about this. Uh, she qualifies this by saying, do you mean reviewing theory for change and then applying this to the planned intervention or context? Okay. So I, I think, you know, there's there's an existing body of literature, um, you know, about changing and change, change of behavior. And, uh, you know, we would do well to, to engage with that. There's an existing body of literature, as you know, in relation to implementation science. And, um, you know, we, we would do well to, to engage with that. Um, I th think that, so, so, so th those are things I think that we, that we should be doing. Um, where, where I think realist evaluation complements those things is in its attention to mechanisms. So most of those things I think will be looking at context They'll be looking at the nature of um, interventions. And of course, they'll be looking at outcomes. But usually they're not looking at mechanisms, at least not in, in the, those realist terms where human agency is, is, in, is in the foreground. So, um, so I think, yes, you know, probably realist evaluation, as I've mentioned, it, it does not link at the moment that effectively to those wider theories. And I think it could, it could do that. But it does have this particular thing of, I think, of mechanisms. If we can understand those, though, though, that's a very important thing and how that interacts with context. So um, I don't know if that answers the question. A, a program theory in my mind is, um, think about the, this also fits, I'm sure you're aware, with the MRC's um, framework for the evaluation of, of complex interventions. Because one of the things that they want you to do is to, develop your own theory about how things again are supposed to work and um, that's what a program theory is really it's saying okay here's theoretically how we think we're going to get from the inputs to the outputs that we're interested in thanks peter thanks very much um we our colleagues in launceston i think just with that break that pause in the internet connection just wondering if you wouldn't mind just spending a few minutes, perhaps just going over one of the examples where you're applying realist evaluation, just so we can crystallise that. And I, again, sorry for participants for that um, discussion. No, no, Would that be no. okay? Maybe just a, maybe three, it's pretty on the spot. I'm sorry, Peter, but maybe in a few minutes, if you're able to sort of or, or at least articulate it from your own, uh, from an example you think um, that comes to yeah. mind. Do they mean the one that, that I'd already done? Uh, yes, yes. So I think that, that uh, yeah, it might have been without well, let, me, let me let me do that then. Or, or okay. if there was another one. But as easy as I think to do with the slides. Yeah. Um, so they could see it see. but not hear it. Yeah. Yeah, I see, right. Okay. Um Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. No problem. And so yes, here was the example I gave, which was of uh, an exercise intervention for women following treatment for ovarian cancer, a realist evaluation of a co-designed implementation process. And the aim was to develop, implement and evaluate an exercise intervention for women following treatment for ovarian cancer. Um, and that was to be based on a th program theory to optimize implementation. 
that went through three stages, realistic review, co-design workshops, and then actually implementing <coughs> the intervention built on that program theory. There are the methods. Um, you know, that you don't have to use those sorts of methods for risk evaluation, but that's the ones we use. They seem to be the most sensible. And these were the results. So we, we actually, this, this went very well. Um, <clears throat> good recruitment, very good adherence and retention. And we were able to then synthesize our theory. And here's one part of the theory in relation to adherence. So what this showed us was that if, the intervention should be home-based, it should be flexible. By a flexible event, people can come on and, on and off it as their ability changed. That it had to have a suitable booklet. This was interesting because we, we, we had a booklet with a sort of a fit-looking type person in it, and nobody liked that one. They wanted a booklet with, which looked like them. So we, <laughs> we got a, um, a, a very helpful middle-aged colleague to... Um, to be the model for our booklet that, that went down much better an exercise diary weekly telephone support and a gradual increase the mechanisms by which this worked was that um there was reduced social anxiety for the women in terms of just engaging with um with an exercise intervention um, they felt an obligation to the facilitator so they part part of the reason why they kept on doing the intervention was they didn't want to yeah. Um, that the they, they perceived the goals of the exercise to be achievable, that they enjoyed it, it gave them feelings of competence and control, and it helped them to think of recovery. And those are all things that were going on inside of them that made them adhere to the intervention. Some things in the context. Helped. So that's how's that? Would that would that? Uh, is that thanks enough? Thanks very much. That's that's really helpful, Peter. Thank you. And I've just um, a couple of other comments have come through. Just thanking you. And just in terms of resources, and obviously we um, we will be sharing the um, the uh, the recording of the of the webinar, and some of your references are there. But if people have a kind of a one hundred and one guide on realist evaluation that you'd recommend people. Uh, refer to is there anything above and beyond what you've got in the presentation that uh, and if so if not um, if you can't think of one now maybe you can send it through we can share it through um, sure and yeah I've, I've got some I've got some um, references at the end which oh, which may be may be useful to you oh thank um, you that's great but listen anything anything I've written <laughs> what was that sorry yeah I like it. I like what I've written so uh, <laughs> Thank you. No, that, that's really helpful. That's that's much appreciated. Peter, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And I, I think it's um, uh, for many of us who are not familiar with this particular approach, it's, um, it's given us a great deal to think about in terms of, you know, how we might, you know, normally go about evaluating a particular approach to care or an intervention or what have you. So um, uh, it's given us another lens by which we can consider um, how we might evaluate uh, certain approaches. So um, that's greatly appreciated. And um, enjoy the rest of your stay uh, in Australia. Um, and uh, we we'll hope to see you again uh, in the future. Um, and just a big thank you uh, to uh, the uh, participants. Thank you for your uh, attendance today. I know it's an extremely busy time of year, so it's greatly appreciated that you're able to make some time today. And thank you very much, um, to the Ministry of Staff at the Centre for Palliative Care and uh, and Molly and Alfie um, who work with the Palliative Care Research Network. Uh, and a reminder for those who are not familiar with the network, it's free to join. It's um, uh, www.pcrn.com.au. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we share information about um, uh, areas around evidence-based practice in palliative care and try and foster collaboration wherever we can amongst our members. Um, and so I encourage you to have a look at the website, in particular, uh, some new initiatives around our consumer research program, our Voices for Palliative Care, which is really starting uh, to evolve rather rapidly. Um, so that's really exciting for the research network and the influence that that group can have on improving palliative care, not only research, but um, service provision as well. Uh, 
thank you one and all and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your day and uh, hope you have a, a festive, good festive season, a chance to um, to get some time out and refresh. Uh, and thanks for your, your attendance today. Much appreciated. All the best to you.